This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. And with me today, wouldn't you know it, on the day of the big announcement from President Trump, we have back... Where's your MAGA? You were just wearing a MAGA hat, weren't you, Hans? What's going on? What are you, what are you embarrassed now? We have Hans yeah. on the show. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a DeSantis guy now. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> you and everyone else on, on right-wing Twitter, it seems like. Yeah. Donald I know you Trump. Were very, I know you were very bummed out about those midterms, right? You, had, you, you were a big Carrie Lake fan, supporter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I want to get rid of all those Mexicans. The yes. border, you know. I think you, you know how I do against my own kind. Build the wall over and over. I heard a little bit of that coming from your voice. Hey, we got Jeremy yeah. here on the show, back with us again. Uh, not long after our program on Halloween ends. How are you doing tonight, Jeremy? You are still on mute. You're still on mute. You gotta <laughs> hit the button. There you go. I'm ecstatic. Thank you for having me back on. Uh, yeah. And fresh off of the midterms, where, where it was the. The most important election of our lifetime, as they've never said once. So, yeah, yeah. everybody Demo felt democracy. It. We can all agree it? it was the it's most just... important to date. Yeah, to well, save democracy, you got to vote for one party. Indeed. Um, so tonight, you know, on a very political note, this is a political film we're discussing today. Um, the theme of the show tonight is Peter Vax assholes, which I don't think is his debut feature. Right, he might have had one before this in 2014 or so, but uh, this is this is probably Boy. the one that is most accessible that has come out, and uh, what? it was what what really yes. <laughs> what else has he done? Fucking BDSM torture <laughs> porn videos. <laughs> uh, this got released via Vinegar Syndrome, although I think it was Circle Collective was the company. They have a couple of different imprints where they put out their their niche film. And this was released around the same time as Scary as 61st, which is another movie that features Betsy Brown. She is the star of this film, Assholes, and arguably the star of Scary as 61st, though that could be easily debated. And uh, what, what do you think is a more dignified role for Betsy Brown? Um, I don't remember her eating ass on Scary as 66. Scary or 69, scary 60, whatever. what? Uh, in that movie, she got possessed by an Epstein uh, victim and masturbated right. and was drooling and touching the doorknob of his estate and doing all sorts of funny things. Right. Mm. Um, can I say neither? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember her covered herself in shit in that movie, though. And she does that here. So... I guess depending on where you are in the spectrum of art, um, it, it, you'd pick one of the two. I, I would say neither. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, Jeremy, what about what about you? Have you seen Scary Sixty first? Yeah, I, I caught it when it came to Shutter, um, and I liked it fine. I didn't mm -hmm. think it was uh, phenomenal, but it was at least uh, it was it was it was just kind of just interesting that it would even go. Take, take on a narrative like that when it was just unpopular to do it but yeah that was my introduction to i think to betsy brown who i guess has her clutches and just always playing a bad shit crazy person in just about everything that i've seen now i saw a short film she did recently i think that was this year um and yeah yeah so she's a she's a character she's certainly a character i'll, I'll commend her for uh not being hesitant to dial things up to 11 in every film that she appears in uh that i mean listen a great deal you asked me to do a scene where i was showering for uh massey lottery and i said no because i didn't want to show my breasts so good for <laughs> I was, her i, I wanted guess. to shoot you from the shoulders up shirtless yeah. and uh you politely declined yeah so uh yeah that so, that's not the most easy thing in the world and in assholes there is quite a lot required of her from her yeah brother the director of the film peter vack and she shares many scenes with peter vack her brother and also her mother and father so it's a family of real nice yeah you know back you know, in back family. in 1994 1995 this would get a good cute clamshell release from universal pictures you know you put it on your shelf next to we're back the dinosaur movie and 
uh, maybe Fox and the Hound. You know, one of my yeah, favorite I, I... one of my favorite things uh, about this movie is that it was released around the same time as Hotel for Dogs. What's Hotel for Dogs? <laughs> Is that the George Lopez? Oh, no, that's Beverly Hills Chihuahua. Sorry, I got my dog movies confused. Are you sure you're not thinking of Marmaduke or something of, of the cats and dogs? Marmaduke. I'd <laughs> never mentioned that movie on this show. Hey, how did Clifford. you discover this film, Jeremy? Uh, I guess uh, just uh, blindly exploring Peter Vac. I found out about Private Chat, I think, through your program. And then beyond that, I started to just kind of go back into his, uh, yeah, Peter Vac's career. Peter Brown, I guess that's his, his stage name, right? Or am I getting that? Uh, yeah, I, I th uh, Peter Vac's stage name. I think his dad is Ron Brown, and his name is probably Peter Brown. That's a very boring name. Yeah. Peter Brown. Yeah. As a fellow brownie, I, yeah, I, it's very, very, very dull. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, I, 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 had had this on the back burner for a long time. And I, I, we had recently brought it back up on my show. And so, uh, on a whim, I just found a copy of it just playing online, but I, I kind of want to check out the vinegar syndrome version of it now it's that, that I guess they've completely restored it. Um, and I'm sure I have plenty of bonus material to, to get into. Well, I, you know, I, when I got this movie and I got private chat from vinegar syndrome, uh, just because I was in the mood for watching, that sort of like new, I wouldn't call it Gen Z because these are all millennial filmmakers, uh, but that new texture of New York filmmaking. And the Assholes Vinegar Syndrome Blu-ray comes with three different commentary tracks. And the first is between the two lead actors and, and Peter Vac, and it's right around the time that they finish the movie. And everybody's in good spirits and kind of joking around. And then one is between Peter Vac and Betsy Brown, and uh, kind of the same thing. It's also around the same time. And then the third one is for the Blu-ray release, which occurred, I believe, late last year. And it feels like three strangers talking to each other, like they have just grown completely detached in the years since making this movie. Uh, and it's kind of awkward to listen to. Like the, the heavier set lead actor in this film, his name isn't coming to mind at the moment. Hans, if you could f fill me in on that, maybe. Uh, just seems like not really interested in being there or talking to either of them and he's sharing the same stories he shared during the first commentary track and they're acting surprised nonetheless i guess they forgot apparently so the the old hag that's in this movie that was uh i guess linda blair's stunt double on the exorcist hated this fat kid despised him and uh, he kept saying on every commentary track yeah you know what she said to me one time she said to me wow, you're not afraid to be boring, are you? And so that's just something that would repeatedly come up and it seemed to really get under his skin. And uh, it doesn't seem like he's been up to much as far as film goes since. Patrick LaBella? Is that That him? doesn't sound only, right to me. He only has one credit. Either that or Jack Dunphy. I, that's him. That's him. Jack Dunphy. Oh, okay. So. Yeah. Hans, you were kind of strong-armed into watching this movie just for the program. You probably never would have watched this film. Probably not. What is um, your take on on Peter Vac's directing <laughs> style? Um, it's it's not for me. I think is the nicest thing I can say. Um, I I just couldn't. I I got out of this. You know, I feel like it could have gone in a lot of different ways, and then it ends up going nowhere. Uh, and it, it felt very improvised, everything. It felt like he just put a camera improvised there and was like, way? yes, like Ghostbusters 2016, where, where it's like, all right, well, think about anal sex and talk about it for five minutes, go. And then he just talks about anal sex for five minutes and just goes on and on and on. And there's no really much of a point other than he's about to have anal sex in the next scene. Uh, but I just feel like the story goes nowhere. And and again, um, this whole texture that you just mentioned about New York filmmaking now, I just don't think I'm the target audience for it because I just don't, I guess I just don't get it. Maybe I'm too old or maybe I'm just not art, art, artsy enough to understand what they're trying to do. I think you're the same age as Peter Vac. I, 
I'm an old it's like thirty five. Uh, no, <laughs> oh, I'm old. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little I'm a little older, but uh, it's just I don't know. I I I try to to find enjoyment in it, and I, it just felt even though it's very short. I think it's like seventy minutes. Um, the fact that it feels so unfocused and so all over the place, and and how as the story progresses, um, whatever happens just kind of happens, and and they just all right, well, this is happening now, so let's just keep going with this. It, I just couldn't... I, I stopped watching it three times, um, and I finished it just like half an hour before we started recording, and I I just... Uh, not for me, I guess. It's the same with like the scary of 61. Am I getting that number wrong again? <laughs> no, you got the, you got the number right, oh. just not the, the pronunciation correct. Okay, the scary man from the 60th floor. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, it's just, I, I, I don't get it. It's not, not, I'm not a target audience at all, I feel like. And uh, what I was telling you earlier uh, before we started recording was that it felt very much like when I was in, in film school and they, and we were studying the Dogma 95. I think 95 uh, um, movement where everything is very loose and everything is very improvised and just let actors be actors and do whatever they want to do. Uh, not for me. So that's, I guess, a, the nicest thing I can say about this. You know, I, I'll, I don't know if I agree or disagree with you because the sum of the parts here, I don't, equal anything great or all that interesting necessarily but there are aspects of it that i really enjoy mm. uh, such as for example when they just went out to times square and actually harassed people for the movie and uh knowing that that jack dunphy kid could have very well been stabbed to death or fucking stomped out oh, or yeah. something really bad could have happened to him at any point and he's still went for it throughout and really probably pushed it too far in a lot of instances i think mm -hmm. i might have heard some n words that were shouted in times square or something which my yeah. god um that was uh that was something really fun i'll say uh just knowing because to do that anywhere first of all to behave in that manner in just like a department store or something is one thing Right, but to take it to Times Square where you have just like the least civilized people on the planet coming in and out. I think it's the rape capital of New York City is Times Square. I'm not even kidding. Um, it's very bold. And so I, I appreciate the things like that, but the, I don't know. The, this movie doesn't really come together because it, it feels like around that time, they just lost the idea of how to end the film. Right. Mm -hmm. So it feels like you have a 45 minute movie and then like 20 minutes of we don't know really what to do here. Uh, yeah. So we're just going to end it with like. Uh, what, what was a and E style interventions show with pros yeah. this expensive prosthetics. So it kind of diverts into that. Uh, Jeremy, did you have a problem with the transition point within the film? Uh it was a little jarring. Uh, you know, it's funny you, you bring up the you both bring up the length. You know, it feels like it's almost tr trying to stretch itself to a feature length because it is such a. A very, very kind of simple by the numbers concept where it's just two people that fall madly in love and gross out humor ensues. Um, what I what I liked about uh, just how I guess how misdirects you so many times is it's very abhorrently vulgar um in a time where you, you just kind of like you kind of let it take the reins and just kind of um take you across just the crazy atmosphere of new york around a time when you know a lot of movies especially the reactionary kinds weren't tackling this kind of subject matter um even if it's done for laughs or if it's done for just the sake of grossing people out um I wasn't personally grossed out because I could just kind of see through the effects, but it was still, uh, I think, I think the overall raunchy tone, um, at the time when it came out was needed. Now it kind of doesn't stick out as much as a, as a sore thumb amongst some of its other peers, but, but going back to your first question, that transition was jarring. And I, I don't know. I think I just kind of accepted the film on its own 
terms that for for what it is but i don't know if i would have liked that when i first if i saw it back then when it came out so yeah i feel like this arrived at a time where uh you know one genre that seemed to be doing particularly well in literature was han's favorite bizarro the genre now hans you, i know you're kind of uh not a historian, but just like a foremost expert of the bizarro genre. Could you just describe briefly what bizarro is? Yeah. How about uh, Donald Trump becomes president and we get invaded by aliens that instead of uh, uh, UFOs, they uh, ride in titties that shoot dicks out of their titty. Uh, and then when the titties hit the floor, they turn into uh, menstrual blood. That's it. That's <laughs> that's the story. That's so that's ridiculously close to about four novels that have been produced in that genre. So yeah. that's that's exactly correct. It's it's a horrible genre unless you're just kind of like you have a child brain at age forty, and uh, that's that seems to be the type of people who write and buy and publish those types of books. And so I feel like this movie arrived right around that time, and maybe got a tad bit of attention because of that. Uh, I don't know what people might have been familiar with with any of these parties around that time that could have launched that because everyone in this film is unknown, right? Minus the stunt double from The Exorcist, but even that's like such a deep cut. Um, I can't imagine anyone showing up to the theater just because Linda Blair's stunt double happened to be in the film. And, and this you can tell get, because you don't even you don't even know her name. You you just I think it's Eileen son. something, but I just you know you think of an ugly woman and the name Eileen <laughs> comes to mind. Um, I maybe I'm wrong Eileen about Dietz. that. Eileen yeah. Dietz. So yeah, I I don't know. I I think it's more interesting as like the installment of a movement than as a film itself. The fact that somebody did manage to put this together and uh, use their family and whatever resources and then took it to the extreme levels they did is probably more valuable than the film itself. And I'm very interested in seeing what Peter Vack comes up with. I don't know if he's as good of a director as he is an actor, right? That has yet to be seen. Uh, certainly with Private Chat, I think his creative force, based off of the commentary I listened to on Private Chat, uh, not to speak ill of the director of that film, but he sounds like a fucking idiot. Uh, he sounds like he really lucked into having a really good movie because of the cast he was working with and having Peter Vack as like a primary collaborator as the star of that film. Because he's talking about things, little creative um, indulgences and whatnot that don't seem impressive on the screen. He's talking about things that aren't obvious to the viewer that I did not ever pick up on, like... For example, in private chat, Peter Vack is going to be uh, evicted or whatever. He's struggling with his money because his roommate or whoever was, he was subletting was uh, committed suicide, right? And so the director keeps referencing how, you know, oh, there could be a ghost in this scene of the dead roommate and, uh, you know, just kind of things like that. And it's like, dead roommate? I forgot there was even a roommate to begin with. I don't, like, I, who's paying attention? And I'm, I'm one of the biggest advocates of this movie that completely went past my head you're thinking of ghosts in this scene where there's no ghosts and like talking about this is a callback to that it's all like very minor shit that nobody but the director nobody but the person who labored over the film intensely and was in the zone and knows this thing back and forth would ever pick up on and then you know you you hear about the conversation they're talking about conversations they had about the editing bay and um peter vack giving criticism about like this scene is useful this scene is boring it's got to go da, 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 da. so we can very matter of factly about the film and um it seems like his presence on that movie did much more good for it than what might have been released if he had not been part of that because i have seen ben hosey's other film um and it was bad. It was not a good movie at all. It seemed, again, like one of these very self-indulgent, we're shooting on 16 millimeter, we're using a cast of nobodies and talking about Occupy Wall Street in the years 2012 type of movies, which is kind of adjacent to Bizarro, actually. So I don't know. Is I, it uh, The Lion's Den or no, Annunciation? No, no, no. 
uh the what was the other one annunciation annunciation it's actually a, a special feature on the private chat blu-ray which is uh much oh. lighter on special features but has more deleted scenes there's about 12 minutes of deleted scenes on on that blu-ray disc and it's it's worth picking up if you're a fan of the movie i think um you know they restored it pretty well and everything that's on there as far as supplements is interesting um and it's probably a much better film than than assholes so uh, i do see that as like another leg in this kind of building pulsating uh, new york film movement which seems to be culminating to more films that have been shot but not released and jeremy we were talking about at least one of these movies over dms uh, prior to doing this episode now um, one of those movies is uh, actors which also yeah. stars uh, Peter Vac and, and Betsy Brown and I believe that was directed by Betsy Brown right yeah yeah and uh, that one just from the I guess the blowback alone from those that actually screened it and viewed it um, was like the first big draw like now I gotta check this out if I can get my hands on a copy or if it finds a secure release date you said it was going to be screening sometime soon and or it's, it's going around some circles i guess in, in new york i believe they're holding a screening uh at maybe it was like the roxy theater or something i'd have to go back and check um uh, later this month but i won't be in town for that so i'm not going to be able to check it out it seems like there isn't a distributor that's attached to it it's just been in limbo for the past year which is where a lot of these movies seem to end up for a period of time. It's like they get shot, they get completed within a year and a half, two years, and then they're on the shelf being submitted to festivals and nobody wants to buy them and you hear about them, you know about them, but they're just privately withheld. And I don't know, hopefully somebody does purchase that. It seems like it's interesting. And uh, the reviews that have come out about it have particularly had gripes about Peter Vax portrayal as and th I'm, this is all secondhand I don't know because I haven't watched the movie uh, an actor who goes trans in order to get more work as an actor is this the the um, screening they did where they had a journalist and it was pretty much just to make fun of him with Nick Nick Mullen was there and who else was it? Do you remember that? We talked yes, about that in yes, the I, old episode. I was supposed to be at that. I was supposed to be involved with that with Cisco. Right. Um, no, this is... A, so that... I, I I might have the lore incorrect here, but it's pretty similar to what, what this is. I believe that journalist saw actors, reviewed it, and said it was a piece of like neo-fascist filmmaking because it was making light of trans people or something because Peter Vac is in a wig and uh, is a woman in the film... Um, and then Peter Vac directed this movie called, I think, Rachel or Ormont, Ormond, Ormond dot yeah. com, yeah. and invited I out this, this journalist named Crumps and Crumps mm -hmm. is, uh, kind of just like a soy guy. You know, he's always complaining about stuff. He's got a sub stack. You pay five bucks. You can read his. What do you, would you see a photo of him, Hans? I saw that. I saw that face. Let's no, just, I just picture of Crumps real quick. It's not a picture. It's just how long the article is. Like, how how do you write 10,000 words on how you just got a humiliation <laughs> in front of a crowd? It's to let them. Oh, what else are you going to do with that experience? You got to monetize it somehow, right? I guess. So this was all held at a theater. So when Peter Vac started rolling on this movie and somehow got a bunch of like, B tier right wing internet people. Curtis Yarvin was there. I believe Dasha from Red Scare was there. Nick Mullen from Come Town and the Adam Friedland show was there. And Nick Rochefort from Million Dollar Extreme also happened to be there. And they were just kind of, I guess, positing questions to members of the audience, which included them, and uh, encouraging the audience to say very inflammatory things, chanting very inflammatory things about this crumps character can we just find a photo of crumps uh real quick i feel like a man with the name crumps deserves to be seen that's a real doozy they got crumps surrounded <laughs> they did they really well, did surround him there he was positioned right in the middle of the crowd so he couldn't just get up and escape while everyone is just saying horrible things to him 
Yep, that's crumbs. Know your meme? They made <laughs> boring face, man. Mike Crumpler. A crumpler. Yeah, that's worse. <laughs> no wonder he goes for by crumps. Crumpler is a horrible name. Uh, so we're taking a look yeah. on, over on patreon.com slash lowers for the video version of this. We're taking a look at Mike Crumplar, a.k.a. Crumps, uh, Know Your Meme page. By the way, you want to type in Soy Boy on, on this, this website real quick, Hans? And just see what comes up there. Oh, hey, who's that? Who's confirmed? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, so wow. there you go. That's yeah. my claim to fame. <laughs> that is uh, White Kenny. So uh, Mike Crumplar has his own Know Your Meme uh, page where they go into detail uh, at length about this journalist. Now, what is, what is he known for besides this? Because I don't think he came to fame. Uh, because of his feud with Peter Vack. Uh, he argued that uh, Elliot Roger, uh, he argued that the manifesto should be read seriously and required an informed critical approach. Oh. Wow. He, analyzed ins he analyzed insults from a Frodo Marxist perspective. Fr Freudo. Ugh. Freudo. Not Fr Frodo from Fredo. Lord of the Rings. Fredo. <laughs> Fredo. <laughs> Fredo the Marxist, Marxist perspective. perspective. Arguing the incel phenomenon expressed in American society troubles with race, class, and gender, and that the concerns the concerns of incels should be read seriously as representing a real problem with modern society. So he was Jordan Peterson in 2018. Okay, cool. He probably bear witness to uh, Jack Dumphy's uh, reckless behavior in Times Square, and uh, that probably scarred him for the the rest That's of his illustrious career <laughs> that's probably where the claims of fascism came from is the, the witnessing of jack dumphy well it seems like he's kind of a sad individual this mike crumplar he doesn't look happy in any of his photos and notice that there's no smiles there's no smirks there isn't a, a jolly glint in his eye in any of those pictures that's something you can always say about hans is even if he's complaining he always has a jolly glint in his eye that's what everybody always tells me uh, the academic. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a, you know, that's such a typical Brooklyn apartment is the beige walls and the one plant in the background, the one unappealing plant. Plastic plant. Yeah. Cool. So, so this is what you get when you sign up to patreon.com slash Laura's $5 tier is all these photos of Mike Crumplar. Uh, we will be selling prints of those very soon. Uh, so T shirts with his face on it. What do we know about Rachel or Ormond dot com besides this whole event that has been staged, which will probably be the most interesting part of that movie, maybe. We'll see. The most I know about that one is that it's uh it's like a I guess like a sci fi satire of uh just being in isolation. Is another one of these isolation movies that I think we're starting to get bombarded with. A little too heavily now um perhaps it was an idea that they had crafted back in 2019 or 2020 but it's we'll see i don't know much about it beyond that it's just that uh i know dosh is in it um and betsy brown is in it and a few others yeah it has a Chloe very stacked, cherry stack cast oh yeah 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 so there was a i think like a variety press release that was put out about this movie that featured dasha chloe cherry and somebody else so uh, it seems to have more star power behind it. But uh, I, I don't know when we'll be seeing that. It seems like nobody wants to buy these movies uh, and distribute them. It's very uh, unfortunate. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's the audience other than people that, I guess, love irony? I, I guess... Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I who are these movies for more, other than themselves? I think it's more just people who are over, not overwhelmed, but just like very done with the synthetic nature to even just like standard commercial movies, mid budget commercial movies that are put out in theaters and on streaming and just want something that is radically different from that. Um, I would say that that's at least my reasoning 
for going to many of these films and, and being open minded enough to watch them. What about do you? Do you think this is taking? Well, I, I, do you th- uh, Hans. <laughs> sorry. Uh, do you think this is taking over from what Mumblecore kind of did about twenty years ago? Yeah, I think that's that. That I think that's a good assumption to make that this is kind of the new thing that seems to be setting in at the moment. Uh, it's still kind of early in that process, but whenever it seems early, it's actually almost over. So, you know, there's probably going to be one or two big ones, and then that'll be that. I was going to mention, I don't, I think what the demographic is for movies of this elk, um, and I don't want to say they're t- the targeted demographic, they just happen to be, it, it's uh, probably roughly in that age of like, th- like 30 to 36 um, millennial, I guess coming off of Mumblecore, which also has now got an audience of people who are, or filmmakers who are now like well into their forties, maybe even approaching their fifties. I know like the, what's a good example of the, like the Duplass brothers were like a big um, byproduct of that. And I think these are kind of now just tapping into some of those ideas, but then also Dogma 95, um, and all these other little old school habits that I think uh, younger filmmakers are not picking up because they are bored with the mainstream stuff. But I'll tell you though, like what it's not appealing to as much as people usually younger than me or or, or around my age in in, in their twenties. Because uh, the other thing that got me thinking about assholes and private chat is that like just the classic hangout movie is. Uh, by and large missing where people are just kind of shooting the shit a game by where the plot is not the main central point of the film and i think most general audiences or or most normie audiences don't aren't aren't quite ready for that or don't accept that quite yet they want something with a little bit more structure that's a little bit more scripted and less loose so i think it's just a it's that very niche audience right now um and maybe maybe that could evolve into something even more. But it's interesting that it's tied so closely to New York, especially with a lot of these um, films that have a very similar uh, quality to them. Yeah, I think, you know, there's one method of looking at this, which is that, yeah, there's the tier of Scary 61st, Assholes, Private Chat. But I think that would also extend to even things like funny pages and maybe good, you know, good time or uncut gems, heaven knows what, what the Safdie brothers seem to popularize in 2015 to 2017. That might be the actual start of that. Uh, even if this particular film movement within that greater film movement has its roots in something a little more art faggy, you know, um, I, I think it's all part of the same thing i think if you have enough of the same faces and you're doing something that has a similar energy to it not necessarily the same style because they're they're all varying in style right so then i think it becomes one part of one texture you know and and that's how i have been viewing many of these films um hans do you think new york is played out uh no i mean i I kind of just like dirty New York, though. I like dirty 70s New York. I find that one to be, that New York to be a lot more interesting than safe, rich New York. Um, because I feel like when you, when you watch a, a movie that's, uh, a 70s movie that's set in New York, it has a, a texture that you can't really replicate anymore um, because of, how much the city has changed and um when you see something like and i don't i don't remember if maniac was in was maniac set in new york yeah okay so so a movie like that where the setting by itself feels like its own character I feel like that's been lost now uh because of how commercialized the city has become and how it's more of like a, a tourist attraction more than what it used to be with all the crime and all. I mean, it's getting back to, to those crime numbers of the seventies, I guess. So that's, <laughs> that's a, a good thing for people that don't live there. But um, I, I just don't think that you can replicate the texture that you, you would get um, back in the day. And now whenever 
someone tries to do that in New York, it just doesn't feel real. Like it just it feels um, manufactured. Um, so maybe you know what we're missing is a little bit more of uh, showing the dirty side of New York instead of trying to make it look glamorous or shooting in all of these uh, high end apartments that are probably not high end in New York, but it feels high end for everyone that doesn't live there, you know? Mm. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know if it's played out. I just, I just feel like the modern version of New York is kind of whatever. It could be any other city. It doesn't, it doesn't have the personality that it used to have, at least in, in film. I think that's true to a large degree. Um, I don't know if... See, Assholes came at a time in 2017 it was probably shot in like 2016 or 2015 where new york was not nearly as bad as where it is right now uh mm -hmm. as of right now it's terrible like the crime rate can you imagine as, yeah can you imagine that scene <laughs> that scene that they shot in times square shot like today i don't think it would have gone that well for them i don't think so either i think post 2020 uh people are well certain types of people are much more ready to do harm uh, and yeah. I don't think that would have flown in the same way or with him using the same language as he did back then where you, I mean, you couldn't get away with it back then, but no one's going to really come at it with the same ire and see if he can get his PayPal f fucking revoked from him and his bank, <laughs> you know, removed. Uh, right. by the way, did you guys see Dave Chappelle's opening on Saturday night live, AKA probably the most enjoyable 15 minutes of Saturday night live since what Adam Sandler was on the show since fucking Chevy Chase was falling down as Gerald Ford. I saw the headlines, but I didn't uh, catch or listen to it yet. Uh -huh. I thought it was, I thought it was really uh, funny and honest and not like Dave Chappelle's, you know, he's assumed this kind of persona where he's like a wise old sage and everything he does should be granted money and respect no matter what. And he, he did have a tad bit of that with his, with his opening. Uh, but for the most part, he kind of went in there just as a comedian without worrying too much about the optics of something. You know, everybody's always worried about, oh, the optics of that won't look too good. You better curb your language. You better not say that. And uh, he didn't really do that. As a matter of fact, he gave the cast or crew of SNL a fake monologue that he performed during the warm up and then went out and nice. did something totally different. So. Just said the case slur for 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're acting like that. That's what happened. I know. Well, that's why I haven't, I haven't seen it, but the reaction was, you know, the most anti-Semitic, you know, you're, uh, you're, uh, uh, giving power to Kyrie Irving and Kanye West with the Jewish hatred or whatever. I mean, it's he like, basically said Kanye was right. He said Kanye is not crazy. Um, yeah. you know, but, Actually, there's not really much of a butt to it. He just kind of said, he, he, I don't know, I, I won't do it justice. I, I think anyone who's curious should just go check out the, the opening there. They posted it on Twitter in two parts. It was very long. It was like 20 minutes, which they wow. never do. Um, yeah. And uh, I found it very refreshing, very enjoyable, and um, kind of a return to form for Dave Chappelle. And, you know, everything in the press that has come out since then, even though the reaction from people has been very positive, NPR is like, oh, Dave Chappelle disappoints with his SNL. He, I thought he was one of us, but uh, I guess not. You know, uh, all these news What rags. was it? Didn't they uh, report on that when, when that guy or I don't remember what it was, guy or girl. Sorry, I don't mean to misgender this person that almost Peter stabbed Rack. him but but uh weren't they like well if you talk about these things this is you know the what's going to happen to you people will attack you or whatever as instead of you know saying that this should not happen because you should be able to say whatever without the fear of getting stabbed right mm -hmm. so now i guess we're back to pretending that they like Chappelle just so that they can say that they don't it makes no sense they, they, it doesn't matter. It's honestly not even worth analyzing, but it's a good opening for Saturday Night Live. So I, I would recommend that uh, just to rewind a bit. How did we get to Dave Chappelle? It was just a direct immediate connection. Oh, right. The N word. 
So uh, that was uh, that was spoken in assholes, and uh, I don't think you could say that now. Hans, do you think you could say the N word? Yeah, you want me to right now? <laughs> do you want <laughs> right now? Right now? No, yeah. I don't. You know, I, don't uh, I, I don't. I don't know if we should make this an Odyssey exclusive program from now on. I don't think we're ready for that. Yeah. Uh, we've been doing all right on Patreon the past month or two, so let's not let's not jeopardize that. But so you don't like assholes? You don't think it's a good movie? You don't? You didn't enjoy the performances? I think he's a very uh, Peter Vex a very interesting actor. I think uh, the couple of things that I've seen uh, because he he is uh, interesting to look at. He's interesting to see his performance, even in this, even though at times it felt very long winded to me. Um, mm -hmm. But he's really good in, in private chat, so I'm interested in seeing what his career, where his career takes him, acting wise. I just didn't find a anything that interesting about this, other than this is obviously done to push boundaries and, and try to uh, get a reaction out of the audience. It felt very, very trauma y you know, where it's like uh, we're just gonna gross you out, but at the same time, uh, with the I guess the layer of uh, independent uh, cinema. So it's like if if uh, the Duplass brothers were um, hired by Trauma to do a, a family drama or something, you know, it, it kind of felt oh, like I that. You were say so to I shoot didn't each other naked. Well, he wasn't naked. It was her his sister, right? Which is yeah, weird. I suppose. Which, yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is not just which like is... you're not just doing a nude scene. It's I need no. you to shove your face in this fat boy's ass could you just do could you just shove your nose in his asshole that's, yeah can you pretend that there's a demon just... coming out of your asshole and the demon is covered in shit and then you're gonna rub the shit on your face yeah I, I I don't, ask, I don't... is there something more going on there in the background uh peter and betsy because i don't know i don't know it's just <laughs> it's yeah i don't know it's new york i would hope not yeah. mama yeah. mama me in new york right that's the thing <laughs> from the commentary track uh it sounded like at least from betsy brown's perspective they did not have a very close relationship growing up and he just kind of ignored her existence or something and then they decided to work together when they got older so i don't i don't i don't they're not an especially close pair from that but to be able to do that, I mean, look, I'll film just about anything. If I had a sibling, I don't know if I'm filming my sibling's face and a fat man's ass naked on top of her and she's nude too. Whether you got a strip there or not, it doesn't matter. You know, it's still what I'm seeing in the, ca you're both naked in front of me. Like that's usurps maybe the, the camera and the whole it artistic process for, I, maybe for me. Maybe I'd feel different if I had a hot sister with big milky jugs, that might be a different story. But Betsy Brown has no jugs. How did you 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 made it worse somehow? <laughs> uh, if she was hotter, maybe I would do that. Uh, yeah, I um, again, it goes back to the the whole mother thing. What's the what's the uh, this director? Uh, the guy with the really shitty hairline, Joe? No, it wasn't Joe Swanberg. Um, yeah, was it Joe Swanberg? Yeah, it was Swanberg. Who Swanberg also to shot his sister? His sister was also getting laid in one of the movies he directed i think uh and what? it's just Are you sure it wasn't his wife oh was it his wife joe swanberg what? and chris swanberg at now oh, that's his, i, thought it was I his think sister. she's a lesbian now actually well how about that yeah and what was that movie called is one of his early i think auto erotic i think it was one of those early ones yeah, this well, has I all been done before. Have... I mean, you're you're completely correct here, Hans. Like, Mumblecore broke the mold as far as we're going to have real sexual moments on camera or close to real. Uh, we're going to film and we're all going to be kind of like awkward looking people in our mid 20s to mid 30s. And uh, then we're going to put that out. And that's going to be the movie. They they did that yeah. in 20, 2011, 2010, 2009. I was going to say around that time, it was just popular to have like the hipster movie um, and just characters kind of talk a little bit more matter of fact. And oh, uh, what's like, what's that one? Uh, uh, there's one film, I think, from like 2010 or 2011 where uh, now I'm getting that mixed up where they drink beer or something like for real. And they, they, they just keep playing with it. Uh, drink drinking buddies. buddies. Drinking buddies. Yeah, I think it was that one. Yeah. 
Uh-huh. And that's one of the more well-polished movies because I think they got a couple of names in that film. The budget looks Olivia Wilde, notably Anna higher. Kendrick and Jake Johnson. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Ron Livingston, Ty West is in it. Oh, yeah, Ty West was part of this too, right? He was yep. part of the mm-hmm. movement, yeah. That's how he got into v- why they were all in VHS, essentially. Yeah, uh, Drinking Buddies was kind of like the swan song to that. I feel like it was that movie, and then Joe Swanberg put out a movie with Lena Dunham called Happy Christmas, and that was a wrap. That was, that was the end of it. So... Um, you know, I did watch one of those again recently called Uncle Kent. Did you ever see Uncle Kent, either of you? Well, was it movie's... good? It was all right. It was fine. It was about a guy who meets a girl from the internet, but she's got a boyfriend and he, she's still staying over his house because they're internet friends. And then, you know, like oh, private hooked chat. up. <laughs> yeah, it was basically, yeah, essentially. <laughs> she wasn't a cam girl, but uh, she, her whole thing was, listen, I got a boyfriend but we're friends, so I'm going to stay at your house, Uncle Kent. And, you know, I wanted to tell you about this fantasy I had of, like, hooking up with a girl. And so maybe maybe I could hook up with a girl at your place and you could help me do that. But I have a boyfriend. And he's like, okay. And then, you know, he tries to turn it into a threesome and she just kind of, like, nudges him out. Because she has a boyfriend, you know? So she's just hooking up with a girl at his place and he's going to bed early. That's Uncle Kent. That's a great film, yeah. American masterpiece. And then they, then they eat each other's ass, assholes, and then they're covered in shit, and there's a shit monster that comes out. I think so. I think that's how that yeah. ended. They did an Uncle Kent Uncle? too, from the guy who directed the Cachism Cataclysm, which I I think his name is Todd Rohal. That's a guy who kind of flamed out, unfortunately, because I thought he had some good comedic talent. He did a movie between those two that was called like Nature Calls or something. It had Patrice O'Neill in it and uh, somebody else. And it was horrible. Pat Oswalt and Patrice O'Neill, I think, starred in the movie. Johnny Knoxville. Johnny Knoxville was in that movie too? Damn. Rob Riggle, Mara Tierney. Why don't we take a look at the trailer Mm. too? What is it? Nature is Wild or something? Animal Calling? Nature Calls. Nature Calls. Damn, I was so close. Yeah, I bought the Blu-ray of this because I thought uh, Cachism Cataclysm was very funny. And that had Steve Little. It felt very Steve eastbound and down. Great. It's got Steve Little and that, that guy with the Jufro, right? The chubby guy with the Jufro? Uh, no, he didn't have a Jufro. He was in Halloween Kills and played Lonnie. Good old magnet. <laughs> These are my scouts. You've set them down the path to turn them into a douchebag like you. Damn, remember Rob Hubell? I think he's doing like Daily Wire stuff now. I think he did Adam Carolla's Daily Wire show most recently. Oh, that's Rob Riggle. Rob Riggle, Rob Hubell. It's the same yeah. guy. Oh, no, Daryl Hammond. Damn, yeah. I just referenced him the other day. Oh. Yeah, this is the last thing Patrice did before he fell over and died. <laughs> it was this, and what was the, the one with Jim Norton? And uh, what was that movie called? It's about... Uh, they're trying to build like an amusement park or something in the woods and then animals attack. Do you remember oh, that? that? Brenda, Brenda Fraser, I think is. Uh, uh, furry Vengeance or something? Furry Vengeance. Furry yeah. Vengeance. Furry Vengeance. Didn't, that had yeah. Brooke Shields or some some yeah. older actress in it. Let's take a look at that trailer right after this. It's a good double features. Nature Falls uh. and Furry Vengeance. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
there's another film similar to this from like the I want to say like the 90s um, called Bushwhacked with Daniel Stern, where he's basically getting pushed around as like a Cub Scout instructor and he's got to get him back to civilization. It's really stupid, but I remember that movie. I remember tr like I saw clips of that movie as a kid. I would always like get in the middle of it on HBO or something and want to watch it in its entirety. I don't know if I ever have. It always felt like part of the Home Alone universe or something because he looked a lot like <laughs> Marv from Home yeah. Alone in it. Uh, you know, what's kind of funny, before we play this trailer, after talking about a Christmas Story sequels nonstop on that last show, uh, there have been some videos people have done since covering all the sequels to A Christmas Story. And I discovered that I was wrong. Those, those three that we cited as A Christmas Story 2 and 2 and 2 are not the only A Christmas Story 2 and 2 and 2s. There is actually three or four Christmas story movies that are sequels to a Christmas story. Were you, were either of you aware of this? No, I just knew of those the first three, but all right, well, we'll get into it after we watch this trailer. Hans, feel free to hit play when you're ready. Have you, have you guys seen a furry vengeance by the way? Fuck. Yes, I have. And oh. Jesus Christ, I'm a, uh, you know how, uh, uh, Jeremy just said that, uh, movies that don't really go like hangout movies don't really exist anymore. Uh, I'm glad that this type of comedy doesn't seem to exist anymore because Jesus, it's just, yeah. And then the animals fart on someone's face and that's the joke. It's just, oh God. <laughs> Welcome to Rocky Springs. Ken Young is in this probably showing his little penis because <laughs> that's what he does now. Yeah, there he is. Yep. God. Wow. Damn, remember when Brendan was a normal size? I mean, can you blame his depression if this is what he was doing after, you know, his 90s run? Yeah. I can. Because oh, he was still doing God. George of the Jungle and shit like that in the 90s. He didn't do yeah. anything special. Well, he's he's charming, starting to get out of shape. Did you see that treadmill shot? He had a bit of a gut. Y yeah, yeah, he was a bit, yeah, homey here. This is like every role like Eddie Murphy would take. Like around this time too, mm -hmm. but like the bumbling dad who can't quite get it together. It's cheaper by the dozen. Number three. Yeah. If only he would understand. <laughs> Should we watch that trailer next? The uh, Zach Braff cheaper by the dozen. Indian cheaper by the dozen <laughs> family. What? That's Zach a thing. Zach Braff always has an Indian family in everything he does. Uh, so hans you saw you saw this movie you went to the theater to watch furry no 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 i just saw that it was playing on tv once and i was like oh is this that jim norton patrice neal movie that they would hey. talk about all the time on there we are yeah there's Patrice. Jim Norton was there's over there. A, oh, since you haven't seen it, uh, there's a... And, and um, well, let's see if I can find it. There's a scene at the end where they do the credit scene. Uh, uh, hold on, let's see if I can find it. Where they dance, and I think... Oh, yeah, here it is. Can we not do this for the show? Can we just 
They still do this too, even to this day. Like, uh, I caught uh, scenes from that Door of the Explorer movie from a few years ago, and they they have like a similar dance sequence. Oh God! Why would movies during this time do this? Comedy films, especially, uh, even some of the better ones, are guilty of hey, let's end with a musical sequence with people performing. Rat Race was the first one that comes to mind, where they ended with all-star they crashed a smash mouth concert uh and then even like tropic thunder fuck look at his stomach that looks so uncomfortable yeah. <laughs> damn do, uh, do you think that the audience that enjoy well if there's an audience that enjoys this type of comedy watches this and they're like yeah they're having fun i'm having fun hey that song is familiar they're little dance five minutes god knows how many hours to shoot this <laughs> who's enjoying I this i don't i, I don't know what the mentality is i think they just think uh we I, gotta I, eat I, up I the end i i don't know i really hope the whale just like ends with full on <laughs> 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 he has a fat bastard scene where he's just uh, wearing a thong dancing. Yeah, that's pretty uh, What was terrible. the other thing you wanted me to look up? We need to cleanse the palate uh, of that immediately. So, yeah, what was what was the third thing? Oh, Christmas. I, I just forgot again after saying, oh. Um, Christmas Story 7? Christmas oh, no, no, Cheaper by the Dozen 3. But, yeah. oh, with great. Zach Braff and his beautiful Indian family. Hans, have you ever seen a beautiful Indian family? No. <laughs> Why would you ask me that? <laughs> that seems pretty discriminatory, <laughs> but that's all right. I'm sure Jeremy has. I won't even ask him that question. Mm -hmm. So Cheaper by the Dozen 3, also just known as Cheaper by the Dozen, uh, was released this year. This is a 2022 film that I think Disney put out right all this this does not look like a disney logo this looks like a russian company oh that's the, oh yeah it's disney plus mm -hmm. so this is no longer going to be able to be watched on youtube wait that's the girl from scary movie isn't it no is that regina hall or something like that? no that no that's not that's a gabriel union yes okay Damn, That's he's good. looking so dried out and old now. His face looks... Well, like no one's picture. Indian here. What are you... There's an Indian. Uh, are those his real, like, arm tattoos? Zach I was just wondering that. I, you know, you would think they would have them covered up to be a more wholesome dad or something. Yeah. Is this where he plays a podcaster? There's the Indian. That's not an Indian. <laughs> oh, that, that was one. him. Right. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Well, okay. well, well. Wait, Who's so one out of 12? <laughs> one out of 12 is Indian, and you're like, yeah, he's Indian family. <laughs> These are terrible parents. Now, are those supposed to be his kids? Or did they adopt all those? Or uh, did she have a surrogate 
uh, man. No, no, you've seen it, right? I've, I'm, listen, I'm a big cheap by the dozen <laughs> fan, but I haven't gotten caught up yet. Uh, I the, just realized the, that, oh, go on, sorry. Oh, so he's the certified nanny, probably. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. I, <laughs> the babysitter. I just realized that I confused Cheaper by the Dozen with, with Daddy Daycare. I thought they were the same movie. Now, were you aware there's a Daddy Daycare 2? I think we should be watching the trailer to Daddy Daycare Gosh. 2 up next, just to make it an even four. I believe they couldn't afford Eddie Murphy. So who did they get? They got Cuba Gooding Jr. Oh, no. Classic. Tra- no, that's too- Wait, that's from 2007? Yeah. Okay. Cuba Gooding right, Jr. I've- currently in prison for rape. Oh, seriously? I believe so. Let's take a look. Daddy Daycare. Oh, and they replaced the other guy, too, from uh, the Goldbergs. Oh, Jeff Garland. Jeff Garland. Damn, I I bet you he would jump at the opportunity to do (laughs) Daddy Daycare now. Yeah. Furry Vengeance is just filming like right next to this. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't get like a washed up has been fat guy. Just this random overweight actor has to be paired with Cuba Gooding. They couldn't get Tom Arnold or somebody. Well, you're like Mike Goodman. He looks like some kind of mix of like the bad guy from Dumb and Dumber and the guy who played John Wayne Gacy 20 years ago and Francis from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Oh, yeah. Is this around the time when he was doing that uh, gay cruise movie? No, that was theatrical. I'm pretty sure this was not. I think this went direct to DVD. So he did Snow yeah. Dogs and Boat Trip with Horatio oh. Sands, another outed rapist. <laughs> Fred Savage directed this? Holy shit. No. Another rapist. Wow. Damn. I was just talking the other day about how Fred Savage was, you know, me too and even as a child. Saying to the 50 year old makeup woman, Yeah, I think we're getting dinner tonight if you want to keep your job. Hold on. Joel Cohen wrote this? Yeah, of the famous Cohen brothers, obviously. Couldn't be another Joel Cohen. <laughs> no. Hold on. I'm sure it's that Joel Cohen. Oh, wait. I think no, there's no, a no, story there's about an how H. Bill Murray only signed on for Garfield because he saw the name Cohen on the script and thought it was one of the Cohen brothers, and then turned out, No. Because why would the Cohen brothers do a Garfield script? Yeah, that's the other Cohen, the one that did. Is, is this so? This J- Joel Cohen did um, Monster Mash the movie, Toy Story. One of the writers, I guess, for Toy Story, Cheap by the Dozen, Garfield, uh, Garfield, Attila, Two Kitties, even Almighty, another another successful sequel, and Daddy Day Camp, which is this thing. Sorry, Jeremy, you were going to say And then he never worked again. No, no. Yeah, <laughs> since 2011. There's one upcoming, uh, Shaq's Garage. It's an animation with Shaquille O'Neal. Wonderful. So yeah. maybe we should watch all four of these movies and meet in a week, and we'll talk about them on the next episode. Yeah. Uh, all right. I think uh, we should say to Hans, we'll watch those movies. Mm-hmm. And Hans watches those movies, and then we don't mm-hmm. watch those movies. Yeah, and that's just the way to do it. Kill, my, kill myself by the end of the week, and that's how we end the show. Yes. What do you call this movement of filmmaking? Um, is it dad core? Is it that uh, dumb dad core? Dumb dad core. Daddy Dom core. That, yeah, that's that's what they do, right? It's just dad, but that's kind of goofy and 
You know, he has a little heart, but he's very stupid at everything he tries. That's and, just uh, been entertainment since 1950. Fair enough. Yeah. Since the honeymooners, well. basically. I don't know. Do we have anything else to say about assholes or this New York centric filmmaking that that is taking the world by storm and won the Golden Lion or so, whatever the fuck Scary Sixty First one? Yeah, I guess I'm not looking forward to when I see you in one of them eating ass <laughs> naked on the floor. <laughs> They'll be like, yeah, I used to know that guy. Uh, we don't we don't run in the same circles anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say um, apart from Hans's uh, one star review, which is very entertaining, um, don't listen to all the other like naysayers and, and negative reviews on Letterboxd where uh, they're either saying they were heavily grossed out by this film or it doesn't gross out enough. It, it finds a happy medium if you know what you're in for. So that'd be my two cents. Yeah, I think you got to just kind of take it as um, something that is not even really in contention with other films and, and can be rated like other films. Because as, as a movie, I think it fails just in that, you know, the subversion that we're talking about that we didn't even really get in depth with when uh, bringing that up earlier was that around the 45 to 50 minute mark, of this 75 or so minute film, they decide to venture away from the traditional narrative of how it's unfolded and instead take a turn for this, this sort of like documentary segment where you're being, uh, you know, granted interviews to members of the cast and whatnot as their characters because something happens. Uh, the two lead actors, their faces deform into assholes from being addicted to poppers which I've never heard of a straight person being addicted to poppers in my life, but that's just how the, the movie unfolds. And I don't think it works for the film. I would even argue that it maybe is a little self-indulgent because you get the like home movie footage of, of Peter and Betsy's children and stuff. And it feels, um, I don't know, almost like too, too almost uh, maybe this won't even make sense as a criticism, but uh, too personalized at that point. Um, I don't well, know. It, it feels completely out of place with the first 45 minutes because the first 45 minutes are so ridiculous that putting some real into it for the last 25 is kind of like, wait, so were you going for, like, did you actually rub shit all over yourself and this is, you know, self-biographical or are you trying to, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really fit with what, what you see on the first, yeah, three quarters of the movie, I guess. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And, it, you know, on the the commentary track and in one of the interviews, Peter Vack said that the, the basis of this film was his idea of what a B-movie was, having not watched any B-movies, uh, which I think makes sense of much of that. Yeah. Did but you watch some? <laughs> it, it, uh, I don't think it comes together with that um, last chunk, unfortunately. I think I'd be more... I'm, I'm, you know, I, I again, I, I don't have like a negative opinion of the film. I, I would say, like I said before, I enjoy it as a smaller part of this grander um, collage of film that's forming. But on its own, I, I think you have to know exactly what you're in for, and the reason why you're watching it before you check it out, because otherwise you're going to have a response that's probably similar to Hans. Yeah. I, I was expecting something more close to funny pages because I think you said or you mentioned uh, something not in this show but before about how you know that uh, movement uh, doesn't really exist anymore. So I was expecting a little bit more of a straight, I guess, story, and then this is not at all what I was expecting. No, this is very. We got twenty thousand dollars to rent locations. Let's figure out what we can do. And I would estimate that that was probably the budget of this movie, if that, because I learned that Private Chat was shot for only $86,000, or was it $68,000? I don't know. Uh, some very inexpensive amount of money, and I would assume it's made its budget back uh, pretty well. So this could not have been that much money to shoot, especially since you're using people's apartments that you know and not doing Airbnb or anything like that. You're not renting actual spaces. Um, and just going up to like bodega owners and be like, Hey, can we shoot here for an hour? 
and then being like, yeah, sure, why not? But we got to keep business going. So uh, it's a lot of stuff like that, a lot of run and gun, which I admire. And uh, like like we've said on the show, I, uh, Peter Vax seems to be a very interesting, creative person. Um, whether or not that is funneled out best as a director has yet to be seen. I think he has to produce a little bit more work in order to um, have that sort of three-dimensional uh, uh, critical judgment formed. Uh, but certainly as an actor and, and just a creative voice, I think, uh, you know, he's somebody to look, keep your eye on. Uh, Jeremy, any final thoughts on, on assholes or any of the, the content covered tonight on the program? I'll, I'll add this is uh, not quite movie related, but I, I hadn't realized until recently that Peter Vack had voiced uh, the Gary character from the game Bully, Rockstar's uh, Bully, which I uh, I grew up on. So I was like, oh. Yeah, he's the he's the antagonist in that game. So that's where he got to start, or look look to be his early start. See, I never played Bully before, but I was very aware of it. It was one of those like games that arrived. I want to say twenty years ago, where it was like, oh, should kids be playing this game? Should you know, is this a bad influence on children? It's 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 uh, nowadays it's way too cartoonish to really like consider it like a savage game but like at the time I, I understand why it was probably getting that sort of um or i guess why it was getting called all those different things but uh would you make a game like a triple a title like that today no probably not uh uh maybe like, i'm sure there's a lot of indie games that like follow in that in those same footsteps but it's yeah not today no <laughs> a little too Hans, rough around you... the edges <laughs> Hans, were you were you even a child when these games came out? Did you have any experience playing these these very rough yeah. around the edges uh, games like Max Payne and uh, what was the other one? Manhunt. Oh yeah, yeah. I was really bad at them though. I did play Bully. That was it was fun for what it was. It's just a high schooler beating other kids up and doing shenanigans in high school. Uh, it felt like a. I think it was Rockstar too, right? Mm. Uh, who who did it so yeah. it was kind of like a a little toned down, down grand theft auto set in in like a fancy high school uh it was eh, i enjoyed it when i played it um but i've always been pretty bad at video games so uh just kind of like you uh, so uh so uh go on that's a good way to put it it's gta without the cars basically and you're a teenager yeah you know what i liked i liked the simpsons hit and run Right. Yeah, yeah. That's... See, so th there was a thing here where um, PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 1 got pirated really quickly. So we would just get games for like a dollar uh, and it would just be a pirated copy. What do you mean that you, they got pirated really quick? Like you would buy a bootleg disc that had it burned on there or what? Yep. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if they did that. I'm sure they did in the States too, but they came, came up with a type of chip that would read uh, burned copies. So then you would just walk into any store here, uh, any small store, and uh, and they would have uh, hundreds of copies of any PlayStation game, and there would be like a dollar or two dollars, and wow. that's how we would play them here. And then when I moved to the States when I was like 17, and I got a PlayStation 2, I was like, wait a second, Metal Gear is $50? What? <laughs> I could have gotten this for like a dollar or two at home? That's yeah. crazy. You know, that, that yeah. that's something you only learn, I think, when you travel abroad is just yeah. how even in developed countries, there's a certain standard of if it's not being mass produced or created in that country, other countries will just sell a fake version of it in their like mainstream stores and around their mainstream, like in their shopping malls and shit. And uh, that's just how things are, you know, uh, when I went to uh, Korea and Japan, that was certainly the case where you could see like bootleg DVDs at a shop right next to their equivalent of Best Buy, like right across the fucking uh, corridor. So, yeah, that's damn. I wish I would have had that as a kid. I remember I tried yeah. to like burn uh, Final Fantasy or Metal Gear 3 or something onto a DVD one time. And I was just so pissed off because I went through an entire process as like 13 years old of buying these fake, uh, not fake, these blank DVDs thinking I could just burn it right on there and it never works. So, yeah, I just needed to find the Latin American technician. To to Costa Rica, I I bought a plane ticket to yeah. Costa Rica at 13 years yeah. old. It would have been cheaper. Yeah, we also had uh, uh, places where they 
someone would buy five, six PlayStations and then just burn a shitload of games and you would just pay for half an hour or an hour to play. And sometimes the disc would work, sometimes it wouldn't because it would just be shitty burned copies. But that's that was my, yeah, my my teenage years were spent just playing um, burned copies of, of PlayStation games for a dollar or two. Burn yeah. copies, burn notice. Great yeah. note to end on. <laughs> All right, Jeremy, thank you for coming back after such short notice to discuss assholes. Yeah, the movie, not not literal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you for having me. That was fun. Uh, where can people find you online if you want to plug your your stuff? Um, you can find me over at Jeremoby. I'm on uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Odyssey, and Letterboxd. Um, that's where all the film content usually goes to, depending on copyright issues some will appear in more places than others uh but i recently just dropped my uh monday macabre series for october and then you can also check out a recent uh flea pit after dark episode that i did with uh laura's wonderbread here on the film takeout um hans i think you're the only one i still gotta i gotta get on solo at some point so we'll uh we'll see if we can organize something in the future but yeah uh just that's where you can find me you've had jerry on I've had Jerry on three times now. Oh my yeah. God. And no hot. Yeah. Yeah. I'm starting to take it personal. <laughs> You're like the third person to say the same thing. And I'm like, Jeremy, you, yeah, you should, you should invite Kenny on first and then give Hans the invitation like a month later. That's what you should oh, just do. have me and Kenny so I can say nothing for an hour. <laughs> I worry if I have Kenny on, we're just not even going to talk about the movie. It's just going to be about what he's doing well, that day. He's going to be a well, he's not gonna... macaroni during the show. Yeah. Be... He's not going to watch it. He's just going to be like, oh, I yeah, I didn't see that. <laughs> and just talk about how, yeah, he's girlfriend or it's a bitch or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that sounds like a great future episode. All right. So look forward to that and uh hans and i have an appearance on low society coming up real soon and i'll also be appearing on uh on alex schultz and um g max new late night talk show which i don't even know the name of i'll be doing that tomorrow uh by the way bust back better is the the single that is sweeping the nation i just saw my face right behind a very stoic looking gavin mckinnis um which cool but now i'm a little worried about my bank account after seeing that I don't know. We'll, <laughs> we'll see what happens uh but yeah that's that's gaining in popularity so check out bust back better all right that has been movies for this week thank you for listening